Well, okay. I'm excited today to be speaking with Marnie Patrick Roberts, and we're going to talk a little bit about her role on Polka Dot Door back in the day. And from what I understand, Marnie was the educational supervisor, and I just thought I'd open up by asking you a couple of questions about yourself. If you were to sum up who you are, who is Marnie Patrick Roberts? How would you describe yourself? Well, I'm presently retired, which I don't like to consider myself that, but uh, it's true. Retired people are busier than ever. I have just, uh, I'm the president of a pro art society which gives free concerts every Wednesday in the downtown core. Uh, I just came off a production of a steampunk version of My Fair Lady in which I was Mrs. Uh, Ainsford Hill, Freddie's mum, and that was an absolute blast. Uh, we just came off a cruise, um, a Viking cruise of uh, um, Budapest, Amsterdam. Wow. So at the present moment, I'm also in Calgary, the mother of two daughters who ha each have a, a child each, and they're men, and the family is here. Um, I last worked at Calgary Opera as the uh, education coordinator, and that's when I began the Let's Create an Opera project which, uh, as I told you, hired um, um, uh, librettists and uh, composers to work with kids to create their own operas. And that's still going on, I think, so I'm pleased about that. Um, I'm married to Doug, have been for a long time, and married him in Toronto when I was working on Polka Dot Door. And um, I don't know, that's about it. That's amazing. For You've had a, a, an incredible, it sounds like an incredible, incredible career working with a lot of creative people, and I know that you're a creative person as well. Tell us a little bit, Marnie, how you got into television. How did you first get into television and why did you choose a career in broadcasting and where did you first work? Well, I didn't actually choose a career in broadcasting. Uh, it just happened that I had been uh, in New York for many years, came back, married my husband, was working at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. And I think it was through people like John McInnes and... Uh, Peggy, whom I'd met, and um, people who who said, "Come and interview for for this job at at TV Ontario, or the Ontario Institute for No OECA as yes, it was." Yes, that's right. And I saw it as an opportunity then to to use my skills as a primary specialist and a person who had taught early childhood. Uh, music and early childhood literature to um, to use these skills so I thought it would be just a great idea so I had some interviews I think Vera Novikovsky actually hired me and uh, that that's what it was I didn't intend to be a broadcast person I was very happy behind the scenes working on the planning and working on the organization of the Polka Dot Tour. And um, so after that, I, I taught at Ryerson in the early childhood department. And so I, I moved once again into teaching teachers. Some have suggested that TV Ontario was a pioneer in leading children's education. Uh, some people even cited it as being very experimental in a creative time in the early 1970s. Was this true to how you remembered things when you were working on Polka Dot Door? Yes, I do. I remember it as an alternative, although there was Mr. Rogers and the Friendly Giant. But this was the big alternative to Sesame Street, which was bing, bang, pow, this is how you're going to learn it, That's, this is the letter A, 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 this kind of thing. And we deliberately tried, with Peggy's help, I think, to have um, a more uh, gentle camera works and more gentle cuts and a more gentle show mm. that was built on child uh, um, participation and based on very sound uh, uh, child development uh, cornerstone of that. So it would be like, um, you can do this too, do it with me, mm -hmm. right, let's do this together. So there you are watching TV but up dancing or whatever it was we suggested that you do. And that I think was unique um, as I think about it now. Um, and I'm not sure what's going on now because uh, my children are just turning 40 and their kids are teens, so I've missed a whole lot of preschool there. But it, it seems to me that that 
was um, unique, and it probably was used in the BBC Play School series from which we took the polka dot door, as you know. Mm -hmm. So it uh, probably was um, uh, from that, but that was, uh, the other part was that it was, it was uh, based on, on the, the, the things that children love and need and is with, cons not saying this right, that was uh, with, in, in touch with their developments, mental right. stages. Right. Yeah. right. So that, that was the great part. The other thing is it's broadcast television. It was broadcast. And, you know, we had no tapes then, really, and we didn't uh, have it. You couldn't get it online. So if you wanted to watch it, you had to watch it at the time it was broadcast. Right. And uh, that had a big effect, too, on it. We How tried it out in nursery schools and at homes, and, mm -hmm. and uh, from there we got uh, other ideas. Tell me a bit about that comment, you tried it out in nursery schools. Would you screen episodes to nursery yes. school uh, yes. children? And, and what would the purpose the and the thought? Show into a nursery school okay. and sit down with it and discuss it with the teacher afterwards and um, mainly to just get the the feel of it if it was working for the kids if the teacher could then use some of those activities in her classroom after to say as we saw the polka dot door let's try this sort of thing and to check out some of the uh, performers to make sure they didn't talk down to the kids or or were the kids responded to them and that that seemed to work very well and did you test the show before it went to air or was this already when it was being broadcast you would just additionally bring it in and check it out with the teachers as far as I can remember I think it was both yeah I, we did a bit before it was broadcast but it was a big day when it was broadcast <laughs> oh yeah what do you remember about that day well, I remember Peggy Liptrot had us over for mimosas, and we watched the show and congratulated each other. We didn't do it with kids, but we had a nice time. <laughs> uh, and we were very, very pleased with it, but we still kept ongoing testing. And Is this working? Is this not working? What is happening here? You know? Right. How would you describe the atmosphere of the OECA during your time there? Uh, of all the people that you worked with, who would you say made a significant impact in your life, and how did they do that? I would think it would be Peggy Liptrot, who, who was the director, or what they may call a producer now, but she directed the whole shebang. And I think Pat Patterson and Dodie Robb, who were the writers for the most part, uh, although we got as many, many, many public domain songs and public domain stories as we could. And then Ada Sherman, who was at the Institute of Child Study, who was, alas, no longer with us, as, as is uh, no longer Pat. But anyway, it was, um, yes, all those people together mm. were amazing. And of course, Ted Coney Bear, who um, was a detail man, and he sometimes was difficult for me to handle because he was so specific on things. He would phone me at 6 o'clock in the morning if I was going to be on in, in the control room and make sure I did this, 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 and this, you know, which I had already done, of course. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but I admired his, his work and his, his, his detail and his concern. Aside from the polka dot door, were there any other shows that you worked on or consulted with for TVO? I did uh, guess what a series with uh, Jan Rubisch, a fifteen-minute series in which Jan um, it was like a, a raconteur in a in a uh, an attic, and he had all kinds of wonderful things, and uh, and he would sing about them and work with them, and I think I did two summers or at least one summer two summers with Jan and that show which we shot in the summer. Very cool. That was it. Well, we uh, we have some specific questions now about Polka Dot Door. As you know, Polka Dot Door has become a children's institution and it's fondly remembered by hundreds of thousands of people really all over the world, which is remarkable. That's and you, great. You were on that team that created it, uh, that developed it together. Can you bring us back to the genesis of the show? Can you tell us, I know you've shared a couple of things already, but if there's more, can you tell us more about how it all came about and what your earliest memories of planning for the show? 
um, my earliest memories were, were working with this ama these amazing people, but deciding like Ada Sherman came up with, oh, we need some a title like maybe the polka dot door, and we all went, hey, that's what we need. <laughs> and so you know, going through the polka dots, and we planned, we planned um, treasure day, and maybe get it straight, dress up day, day, f imagination day, right. something, and finding out day, finding out day, yeah, yeah, and. Um, so we figured, that, and the theme was written, which was quite lovely. And then we had this stable of, of um, uh, play school DVDs that we could, well, not DVDs, whatever they were, we could go through the polka dot and see people in Britain doing some things. Right. And the kids who were really with it would say, why are they on the wrong side of the road? You know, uh, the cars, you know, so some of the kids caught it right away that uh, we would go in and we'd see British factories and British scenes, not always, of course, but that that's how we use some of that, some of that material. Um, we also made sure that the Pokeroo was the host. It was probably budgetary reasons to me. So the Pokeroo would then uh, be the host in costume. And some of the women I talked to lately, I was in, in a, uh, a show with saying, and they were in their 40s now, and they said, of course we knew the polka dot, the Pokeroo was the host, because he was never there when the hostess was. Mm -hmm. Now, once we had the hostess as Pokeroo, and, Another time we did a show in a mall and the pokeroo took off his head and was the host and I never I never quit hearing about it for neighbors kids. You can't do that. I thought that was the pokeroo and it was <laughs> blah blah blah. So, you know, we we got this this feedback uh, quite a bit. And um, but to actually sit down and plan, we would plan a whole half hour show with the the writers and the writers would say okay I need a song here I need this here I need the whole song. and it was it was just a joy when I think of it and I I learned to read a script in terms of of the polka dot door in terms of this is the screen this is what will happen rather than looking at it as a stage thing which I had been used to mm -hmm. so it was a real challenge for me and I, I just loved it eventually I would say oh now I can see how that's going to happen you know and we had chroma key for the first time I didn't know what that was I learned that I also took a, a, a course at Ryerson um, just on television and the cameras were so heavy I couldn't move them around you know I can't do that but I, I also learned quite a bit from that so. Did I answer your question? Probably yeah. not. No, no, you did. You did a great job. Help us understand what your specific role was on the show and what your duties were and, and who were you working with and what were you expected to do? Okay, that's that's a big one too. Um, we were, so Ted Connie Bear uh, and myself, were responsible for making sure that the script had the appropriate words and the appropriate concepts. So we were very much in charge of the educational aspect of it. You can't have kids do that. You can't have kids sit down in a trunk or something. You know, silly, that would never happen. But you you have to have the script so the kids would understand it, would understand the concept. So we would be able to say if something was being uh, shot, we're, that's not clear. We're not getting that clear. That's not clear for the kids, I don't think. And that could could be changed. Mm -hmm. um, also, I, I was responsible for many of the songs. Pat Patterson and Dodie Rob wrote wonderful songs. But I was also responsible for making sure that a lot of those songs were appropriate for the kids, that the host or hostess could sing them, that they weren't too high or too right. low for them. Um, that, that they were songs within the kids' realm of, of understanding and possibility and uh, had some actions to them. And mostly if they were in the public domain, a lot of folk songs, um, a lot of things like that. And um, 
also the stories. I had taught children's literature, so I was aware of all kinds of stories. And what they would do, they have a, a picture on, on one easel and another easel, and the host or hostess would read the story, and then the picture would fade, and the other picture would come up during the story time. Uh -huh. That's if you weren't holding it and looking out. And so it would be uh, fade in, fade out on, on a story, uh, illustrated stories. And um, I liked that. That was very, very interesting. So basically, I felt responsible for giving a lot of music, helping with a lot of music and a lot of the literature. And um, uh, just a lot of general basic education concepts that they were sound. Now Nina Keogh and Gordon Thompson were the first hosts of Polka Dot Door. Do you have any fond memories of them? What do you remember about them? Oh, I remember Nina was, Nina was just darling and, and also so was uh, Nona, Nana Griffith and Gordon. Gordon was very, very good. He's, a, he's, he's an actor. And one of the nursery school ladies says, yes, he looks like he's a Shakespearean actor, not a kid's host. But he was a very good kid's host. And um, I think he went on to do, I think he went on to do a, uh, uh, something like Guiding Light or something like That's that. That's right, like a soap opera. opera. Yep, I think I've... he did a soap. Yeah. And, uh, and I remember him being course very competent and, and uh, I think they were a good team the two of them and you mentioned Nani Griffin as well was she part of the the series that you worked on yes yeah Nani was and uh, who's the other one that's now producing Heartland um, Heather Conkey Heather Conkey yeah she was a lot of fun oh wow we did quite a bit of screening with them too because we would look at them on camera when they auditioned and make sure they didn't come off as um, talking down to the kids. A lot of people come off like that, even though they have the best of intentions. Sure. They say, now we're going to do this, and yeah, you know, yeah. you don't need that. So you need very straightforward uh, performance that the, the performance that the kids would would respond to and and enjoy and relate to. Do you remember Alex Laurier as well? Yes, yes, yeah. I do. Yeah, it's another name. Are there any other hosts that you remember that I maybe have forgotten from your time? Well, I remember one, and I was thinking about this this morning. I can't remember his name. He had short dark hair. That's not helpful. But we were doing a scene where a cow came on to this set, and he was to milk the cow. Well, he was a city boy, <laughs> and he didn't know how to milk the cow. Oh my goodness! And I think we lost a couple of hours. Um, which is big time then, trying to get him to learn how to milk the cow. Wow. So you had a real cow on set? A real cow. Yes, a real cow. Wow. We had chickens and ducks and things like that, too. For now, now, you might be able to help me with my chronology of history here. You mentioned Heather Conkey, and um, from the research that I've done, my understanding was Heather Conkey wasn't involved until around 1974. Did, did you work on the series for a number of years? or what? Yeah, I think it was two or two and a half years. Okay. Two, uh, three, yeah. So Heather Conkey may have been towards the end of your time. She was, yeah. Yeah. She was lovely, with a big ponytail. I mentioned to our doctor on the phone, she said, oh, no, not the polka dot dog. And I said, my dear, that was great. So now that we know it's famous, I think it's wonderful. Absolutely. You also mentioned Dodie Robb and Pat Patterson. Can you yeah. tell me uh, your memories of them and what kind of people they were and how they contributed? Oh, they, they could write songs that you wouldn't believe for, for ours. I remember the, the building song. I don't know if, you have, if there's a copy. It's, buildings can be thin, buildings can... Oh, wait a minute. Buildings can be thin, buildings can be wide. All kinds of buildings live side by side. Houses made of brick, houses made of stone. Some are attached and some stand alone. The king has a castle, the horse has a stall. The mouse has a house that's a hole in the wall. Buildings face the east, the north, south, and west. But the building called home is the one we love the best. So all that's kinds great. of illustrations. And I remember when I was in teaching junior kindergarten, I had them all out with the 
buildings. Um, their songs had a lot of words and, and a lot of concepts in them. Uh, Dodie, uh, she was quite a gal. She was going to write a book called Abroad in the Boardroom. But I think uh, before she wrote that, there were more broads in the boardroom. <laughs> she was just so funny and, and just very, very uh, practical and fun. And Pat, you know, Pat was an amazing lady. She and, and as a team, they worked so well together because they would get the idea and then they would go back and forth with each other as they worked on it, you know. And it, it, was, it was a treat. We'd say, like... We need, we need something in here that gets everybody going with this theme. They say, oh, okay, ding, 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 and off they go and rhyme it and make it work, you know. I, um, I was quite amazed. And Pat had worked in early childhood before, and, uh, and so that was, uh, that was good. And um, Dodie was just amazing. She would get things done. Stuff. And they wrote the theme to the TV show as well, didn't they? The theme song. Yes, they did. They wrote. And Angela Antonelli sang it. And what, can you tell us a little bit about Angela, where, where she was from, her background, and if she's still with us? I don't know. don't know anything about it. It, it was presented to us. I never saw the recordings. so I. Oh, I, I see. Okay. So yeah. she probably was just a hired voice musician yeah. to, to go she in was, and do it. Yeah. Very yeah. good. Um, you mentioned some names. Maybe you can rattle them off for us again. Who was a part of that initial team that helped create and develop Polka Dot Door? You mentioned uh, your, you know, yourself, Peggy, Ada Sherman, Dodie, Pat Patterson, uh, Ted Connie Bear. Were there any others? Do you remember any of the early directors? The yeah, others? No, I don't. I remember Ian Morris was a director, but I don't think he was part of the planning. He directed the script. Right. Um, I can't think of anybody else tell you the truth. Those are the... Oh, Dr. Vera Novikovsky was sort of in charge and there were certain story editors that checked things out, but um, she wasn't part of the planning. No. And you, you mentioned Ian Morse. Was, uh, did he direct some of the earlier episodes or some of the later ones? Was his time with Peggy or after Peggy? It was with, with Peggy. Okay. It was with, I, think he, I think he did a few after Peggy, but Peggy was still around, as I can mention, I think. Yeah. Very good. Now, I don't know if you know the name Jed Mackay, but he went on to produce Polka Dot Dora after Ted Conybeare had produced it in the 70s. And yeah. um, his some of his songs were actually used in the early years as well. Um, I'm trying to remember a couple of the names of them, but he was uh, he was someone that, uh, I think in the mid-70s, some of his songs yes. were used as well. What was the name again? His name is Jed Mackay. Jed Mackay. I might have met him. I might have. I don't know. <laughs> Now, you mentioned this a little bit already. Maybe you can elaborate a bit. Talk to us about how the show was based on BBC's Play School. From what I understand, and I think you mentioned this, packages of educational content were originally purchased from the BBC to be shown through the polka dot door. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this partnership and how long it lasted before you guys were actually producing Canadian material? I was, I was still around when we were producing Canadian material. You know, the whole show was written uh, with Canadian material, but then it was just through the polka dot that I think we got uh, British shows, quite often in black and white and, and factories and, and countrysides and uh, uh, places of interest. And it was kind of fun. And was that was that a money saving thing? It's just like we don't have stock footage at TVO, so we're gonna buy it I from BBC. It was Terry. Now I don't know his last name. Maybe some people remember when he bought it. He bought it from Play School and took it over to us. And as far as I know, after that, he didn't have any comment. Uh, he had any. He didn't have any input. So. Um, he, I guess, was in charge of, put in charge of children's programming and, you know, what to do. So this is what he did. And I think, you see, at, when we first went to OECA, it was still full of teachers with respect um, because, you know, they do an incredible job, very hard. But they were people who had risen up to the supervisory ranks mm -hmm. in teaching and then they were put together with the people 
who were in television. And sometimes the educator and the television person did not see eye to eye. Mm. And that, that can certainly happen. I don't remember any incredible blow-ups or anything like that, but it was just a different way of looking at things. So, for example, if I'm in the control room and there's a director and the educator comes along and writes boom shadow on a piece of paper and gives it to the director, that's overstepping. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, that's the director's job, not the educator's job. Right. So the directors had to be very careful and the educators had to be very careful that they don't trot on toes, that's all. And it, it worked. There's some things about Polka Dot Door that I think what a lot of people remember back on it, they're iconic. Things like, uh, you know, Storytime Mouse and Pokeroo yeah. and, you know, all the stuffed animals that they used. Yes. Um, what, what, what types of iconic things were around since the show's inception? Like when you imagine the set and, and, and everything that was part of Polka Dot Door, what made Polka Dot Door, what things do you remember? I know you mentioned Pokeroo and the big Polka Dot Door, but what other things do you remember about the set? There was a big clock, and we had a, an interesting way of telling time. The big hand, um, the little hand is at 12, so that means it's uh, 12 o'clock, and the big hand is at, at, at 30. So there was a definite way of telling time. There was right. a clock. Um, there was also a pianist there. His name was Herbie. His last name I can't remember. He also played at the Three Small Rooms um, bar at the Windsor Arms. So whenever we went in, he would find a little polka dot door tune to play for us. Um, so what else was there? Uh, that's all I can remember, unless it was, you know, about pets, or there was Humpty and Dumpty and Marigold and Bear. And do you remember and, Jack in the Box? Yes. Yep. There was a Jack in the Box. That's right, now that I think of it. Oh, you're good. You're helping me remember. And uh, Pokeroo only came out once a week on Thursdays. Was that st was that yes. part of the original, even from the day yes. one? Yes. Yeah, we thought the Pokeroo. It was a one. He was a wonderful character. A couple of times we tried, and I can still see Gordon Thompson being the host. The Pokeroo always had a way of walking with his feet. He had little steps. Uh -huh. And I remember the time that Gordon came back after being the Pokeroo. The show when he he was doing little steps like the Pokeru did, you know, to so see if people would catch on, you know, <laughs> which was cute. Um, but uh, you know, the people I talked to who who said, "Oh yes, I remember that." They're in their forties, forty five now. They have babies of their own, and they wish they had a polka dot door, you know. Yeah, cute. Tell us a little bit about Ted Coney Bear and help us to understand uh, exactly his role in the show's inception and his role during your time and after on Polka Dot Door. Well, he was a detail guy, yeah. very much a detail guy and uh, very much in charge. Um, so, and he, he very much cared about the shows. But if, if it's possible to be a bureaucrat in television, that's what he was. He, he knew exactly what he wanted and he would say this, this, and this, and this. And, uh, you know, he made a great contribution. He was a little difficult for me to handle sometimes because I tend to be independent as well. But we didn't have any fights or anything. We just mm -hmm. had to work it out. Who designed Pokeroo and whose idea was Pokeroo? Pokeroo, I just evolved from us. I cannot tell you who designed it. But I think we... We decided we needed a fun character, all of us, and I can't remember who said Poker. It could have been Ada Sherman who said Polka Dot Door. She had all kinds of ideas, or it could have been Pat and Dodie. I just, I don't know. I just don't know. No, no memories but, on who actually designed the costume or anything like that? I don't know. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> do, you remember, do you remember who designed the set of the Polka Dot Door and who contributed to the different parts of the set? No. I don't remember that at all. Too busy. <laughs> Too busy making sure everything was all right, I guess. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember. Help us understand how the show was shot. Like how many episodes were produced each year and what was the recording schedule like and, and how many different hosts did you work with over that time? Like was it, did, would you like take, a, take time in the summer and just do a whole series or did, help no, us understand? No, we're done during, I think Peggy explained that 
when I saw her interview. But there were two, two shows a day. And so it was a symbol edited. So you just did one section and went right into the other section and right into the other section. So there wasn't any editing. Wow. There was no, uh, you know, you couldn't re-edit it. So it was, it was like live, it was live television. So unless there was something outrageously wrong, you had to stick to the schedule. And uh, it was very hard as I think of it. On the, the, um, the host and hostess had to know all their lines bang on because there's no time for fooling around. Right. Not a lot of ad-libbing and it was live. Live to tape, I guess. And where are the tapes? Who knows, eh? In the vault at TV Ontario. <laughs> was there any uh, polka dot door merchandising while you worked on the show? Oh, I wish there had been. There wasn't any. There was a book, I think, that we talked about, we saw about. Uh, just a little book for to go with it, but uh, we were hoping to have something with, you know, the recipes and after this show we could do this and this and this, but uh, that never came about and I think we were unaware of the importance of merchandising until Sesame Street came along with all those, with all their characters and um, I guess we didn't have the wherewithal to do that or we thought it would be a good idea or we were just too busy doing the shows. So did you sense at the time that you were helping create a huge cultural phenomenon? And how does it feel to be a part of the team that created one of, really what is one of the most beloved Canadian children's shows ever? I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I was just thrilled to be doing what I was doing. I loved it. I loved the people I worked with, which is a miracle these days. And it was a remarkable period in my life, but I had no idea how it had grown. Hmm. The way it had grown. So I'm thrilled to be part of it. When was the last time that you actually saw an episode of Polka Dot Door? Oh, that would be 45, 50 years ago. <laughs> That's wild. Did you, did you retain anything, Marnie, from the show? Any pictures that were taken on the set? Any, any, anything at all? I had a couple of pictures of... Uh, of uh, the uh, Humpty Dumpty Marigold and Bear, but we never took a lot of pictures either then, you know, we just didn't do it. We didn't have our, our iPhones and we didn't do all that, and, you know, and I watched it with my kids. We adopted our kids at three and two, and so we watched Polka Dot Door with them, and one of Sarah's first sentences was, I want watch Polka Door. So, <laughs> We, we went down and watched that, uh, so that was kind of fun, but that's it. Just a few wrap-up questions. Um, Marty, when you look back to Polka Dot Door, what, do you, what, what about it are you most proud of? I'm most proud of the team, of working with the team. That's what I'm most proud of, and how we produce this amazing, this amazing show, um, all of us. It was just a joy. It really was. Any particular favorite memory from working on the show? I know you mentioned the, the milking the cow thing, but... <laughs> well, just the excitement of, of being in the control room and seeing the, the host and hostess come out on the set and see how it came to be on the screen. And that was just a miracle to me. I mean, it was so wonderful to just to see it come out and then to show people what it was. I was I was enthralled with that. Something to be proud of for sure. Yes. Well, I know we'll we'll take a couple of minutes to chat after we're offline here, but I just want to thank you so much, Marnie, for taking the time to do this interview. And you know, truth be told, we really only scratched the surface surface yeah. of your amazing career. And I know that you uh, have done a lot in theater. And, yeah. uh, but I know the people that are specifically watching this interview online are thankful for your significant contribution to children's well, education and to children's television yes. programming in Canada. So we just want to say thank you. And you thank you for having uh, dug up all these wonderful things. Bless your heart. <laughs> it would have faded into oblivion of some sort, I think. But uh, I'm delighted you took the time. Well, it was wonderful to interview you, and I'm sure we'll chat, chat in a couple of, couple of minutes offline here. Okay, thank you.